National Rehabilitation Forum has come to Accra, Ghana. While in Ghana for three weeks, we're going to take a look at the current state of rehabilitation medicine, as well as look at disability awareness in some of the most remote regions of the country. Before looking at the situation of rehab medicine or disability rights, it's best to take a look at the country from the ground up. Ghana is an English-speaking country of 24 million people, 80% of whom are very religious Christians. It's located in a lush tropical zone south of the Sahara Desert with nearly 400 miles of Atlantic Ocean coastline. It is roughly the same size and shape as Arizona. Developing Ghana's infrastructure is a major topic of conversation for organizers, pundits, and politicians. In the four million person metropolis of Accra, only the major arteries are paved. That leaves most neighborhood streets rugged and dusty in the dry season and flooded when it rains. I'm in Adenta, one of the wealthier suburbs of Accra, and it rained last night. And as you can see, it's flooded the entire neighborhood, which means that uh, I can't go even to the market, my internet cafe, I'm completely shut out. Public transportation is quite cheap in Adenta, with legions of minivans offering rides to the center of Accra for about a dollar. But even though I could get into one of these vans, the drivers refuse to stop for me. That means that the cost of getting a disabled person to work goes from $1 in the van to $25 in a taxi. But these concerns are not going unheard. In fact, just the opposite is occurring. We were invited to attend a meeting of the Accra chapter of the Ghana Society for the Physically Disabled. As difficult as the streets are, people came from all over the capital using all kinds of mobility devices to attend the monthly meeting. The disability community in Ghana is extremely well organized, and in 2007, they were able to get the Ghanaian Disability Act passed into law. Well, I think there's a lot of improvement because the Federation have been able to work hard to get legislation that back their rights. Is the implementation we are self-forcing to to, to effect. And we also have the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disability ratified. We work to get the uh, a percentage allocation of the District Assembly Common Fund for persons with disability. And we also work to get a person with disability as appointed as a national a substantive minister for the Ministry of the Chieftaincy and Traditional Affairs. As well as advocacy, the GSPD also supports inclusion events like sports, music, and arts. Ghana even sent a team of Paralympians to the London Games, including African hand cycle champion Elvis Aloui. I play with basketball, and I'm a paracyclist, and I train with my hand bike um, Saturdays, uh, 50 kilometers. And uh, Saturday again in the morning, I play basketball every Saturday. I'm telling you, West Africa cannot have a potential. If the equal, all this depends on equal opportunity. Because the sports in Africa is like, disabled sports are not going to help the country. But believe me, what I'm saying, in the odd years, years back, disabled took, person with disability, a physical disabled took the first gold for Ghana. And then that year, we took nine medals for Ghana before the Ebo people. So, yes, disabled, person with disabled people need their logistic. Nick Dusufa has a degree in community based rehabilitation and sees great advancement, but not without difficulties. Almost all the structures are not disabled friendly, but all the new structures that are being put up. By the work of other disabled at the university, they are now lifts and ramps all over the new structure. So, for sure, great, great, the future is great. At the university, was it uh, difficult for him to get classes, or did you have to change classrooms? Or Yeah, it was it's very, very difficult. It was very, very difficult, especially some of our lectures are on the top. I happened to, climb, uh, to crawl to the top, but he had to be carried with the wheelchair. But one place where there's plenty of access and disability awareness is the Corley Boot Teaching Hospital in the southwest corner of Accra. The 1600 bed facility allied with the University of Ghana teaches not only physicians, but also physical therapists. I was invited to give a talk on spinal cord injury to physical therapy students. 
but to my surprise, they knew much more about the condition than did a group of medical students I'd lectured to earlier in the year. Rounded. Um, one thing you want to deal, you want to know about with mobility devices, if you see someone come in in their own wheelchair, that does not mean that they want you to grab the back and start pushing. And this happens to me all the time. It happens to me almost every time in Ghana, almost every time I've gotten out of uh, Gifty's car, someone grabs the back of my chair and tries to push me around. <laughs> Dr. Andy Haig of the University of Michigan is the president of the International Rehabilitation Forum, which has been visiting Ghana for nearly a decade. And we studied a lot of countries and found that Ghana was English speaking and stable. And so we really decided we would focus on that country. All of this time, we had a group of Ghanaians who were our advisors. We went there many times, did research, showed that Ghana had a great deficiency in terms of rehabilitation medicine, trained some Ghanaian, Ghanaian scientists, and at this point, we've got some young doctors that are, that are going to go and uh, work in Ghana, and we've got a commitment from their government to build a national rehabilitation hospital. Dr. Gifty Ginyanti is, among other things, a professor of neurorehabilitation and physical therapy. She has lectured around the world and would love to see Ghana develop a school of rehab medicine. Gradually, people are getting to know the importance of rehabilitation in Ghana. Uh, previously, about one year, for the past two years, it was quite silent, but when we started advocating for rehabilitation, uh, multidisciplinary rehabilitation, then gradual people are getting to know of it, and a lot of people are coming out to say that, ah, this is a good idea, and we want to adopt it, and so the future is bright. Another one of Dr. Gunyanti's jobs is as an elder in the Ghanaian Church of the Pentecost. This church of charismatic Christians has more than 5 million members in more than 50 countries. Religion, especially Christianity, is an integral part of Ghanaian life. There is nearly always a religious broadcast on television, gospel music dominates the radio, and it is difficult to find a bookstore that is not 100% religious. But religion goes deeper into our story, as the apostle Dr. Michael Ntumi the former leader of the five million person Pentecostal church is now a quadriplegic. After years of agonizing pain due to a thinning in his neck bones, Dr. Ntumi flew to Germany to have his condition, cervical stenosis, operated on. Doctors hoped he would walk just weeks after his operation, but now, four years later, he is still in his chair with only limited leg and arm movement. Dr. Ntumi, now the head of the German chapter of the Church of the Pentecost granted us an audience where he talked about how his church will lead Ghana's rehab medicine revolution. In June 2010, I was hospitalized in the rehab medicine center in Germany. And I became very close uh, to the professors, medical professors and the director of uh, that institution. And I told them that uh, in my country, when somebody is paralyzed, the expression we use to describe him is that he is confined to the room. He's confined to the room. Because if he's an adult, he might feel shy to crawl. Yeah. And uh, there are only few possibilities of uh, having um, the wheelchairs, so only some very few people do have. So I told my professor, uh, number one, I think when I go to Ghana, I have to see some of the health authorities, the government ministers, and uh, other influential personalities in, in our community so that uh, they give serious thought to the idea of establishing a rehab center that sometimes some disaster has to strike a very prominent personality before people wake up to that idea. Yeah, um, houses, public places like government offices, even churches have no ramps, have no ramps. Because of my situation, my church, that is the Church of Pentecost and others, have begun paying serious attention to um, about access 
or accessibility to wheelchair users and other handicapped people. Now, in all the new chapels we are putting up, they are constructing ramps. Ramps have been constructed into them. And his words are not hollow. In the bustling suburb of Medina, two members of the Church of the Pentecost will be heading up the effort to turn a minister's residence into Ghana's first rehab medicine clinic. Yeah, this facility was built by the Church of Pentecost. The church that owns our hospital, Pentecost. And the church then handed this facility over to the hospital as an ex. So we also intend using this place for the physiotherapy. But while the news of Accra's first rehabilitation ward is exciting, the task is quite daunting. Well, rehab in Ghana is practically non-existent. We have um, a few facilities that have um, physiotherapists that do a form of rehabilitation. That, that is in the very big hospitals, especially the teaching hospitals, and then a few private hospitals. But by and large, rehab in Ghana is practically non-existent. But in Ghana, um, our situation is also quite difficult, knowing how much uh, road traffic accident is, is, is causing havoc to our people. Um, I'm informed from the statistics that road traffic accidents um, eventually cause more morbidity and sometimes mortality than the disease burden in Ghana. So we have a situation where every blessed day there is a form of road traffic accident claiming many lives and maiming a lot. And most of these people too do not have any means of rehab, especially after they have been healed from the orthopedic problems and they come up with uh, disabilities which are permanent and most of them too because of their disabilities they don't have help, they resort to arms, begging and so it's a problem, it's a big challenge that we need to have a solution for. Unfortunately there is no political will, so um, or there is little political will. So, we have a big challenge, and having a rehab center in Ghana, I'm sure, is going to benefit the population. And most people don't seem to care about how we rehabilitate these people after they have been treated in the hospital. And most of them have amputations, and after amputation, a few fortunate ones will have a wheelchair, and that is the best they can get. Apart from that, most of them don't get any support and they lie in the house until they become vegetables to themselves and society. So while it looks like Ghanaians are getting a new rehab facility in the capital, what happens in the more remote regions? In order to find out, I traveled to the northern capital of Tamale. I could tell it was traveling to a remote region when I discovered there was no lift to get me onto the plane. I'm at the transit lounge of the uh, Ghana Domestic Airport where I've been allowed to purchase a ticket to go to Tamale in the north. Unfortunately, they've got no accessible option to get me on the plane, so I'm going to have to climb up the plane stairs myself. Not only is this an extremely undignified way for a businessman to travel, it also means that there was no lift at the airport in Tamale. This greatly impedes the ability for the disabled of the north to travel to the capital. Compared to Accra, Tamale was much more agreeable to people with mobility issues. But here in the northern capital of Tamale, there's much less traffic, the streets are quiet, everything's pretty clean, it's a much more agreeable place. I was invited by Dr. Dazifa Hadzi to speak to medical students at the Tom L.A. Teaching Hospital. While rehab medicine may be on the verge of reality in the capital, it is not progressing in the north. Mm, I think there's a need. There's a need because um, most of the rehabilitation services in Ghana are provided by physiotherapists. And um, the burden is, is too great for them to handle. 
and um, usually I know in other places the facilities leave the team for rehabilitation and there are other aspects that need to be catered for like speech therapy, occupational therapy, so those needs are not met. But physical therapy on the other hand is extremely well developed. I don't think the limitations are, are that different because you saw the equipment they have, I think it's basically the same things they have in most of the physiotherapy units in Ghana. So I think they are quite well equipped. Although the challenges remain. Uh, the environment does not suit people with disabilities. They, even moving around, even their homes, even let's start from the home, even moving around the homes, most of the homes are not designed uh, for disabled people. Uh, most, most of the time they live in uh, this, some of these round round houses and even entering the room uh, becomes a problem and it's also very difficult telling the family that because of this person you have to modify uh, your home or your house, you have to maybe change a little view, some few things like the construction, maybe do some passageway for the person you can easily enter the room. And it, it's very difficult to get them to do all those things because uh, of one, the financial burden that's going to put, put on them. And so mo most of the time, they, they just leave them at home. And that selection of wheelchairs is dismal. This seemingly rugged chair was made to cross through tough terrain but it's not possible to enter a bathroom. This chair has no large rear wheels for self-propulsion, leaving otherwise healthy paraplegics to deteriorate. Unfortunately, ripped up and discarded chairs like this are the norm. But Tamale is still a major city of nearly two million people. Most of Ghana's 24 million citizens live in rural areas with limited resources. To see the condition of the disabled in one of these remote regions, I traveled four hours north of Tamale to Garu, just 10 kilometers from both the Burkina Faso and Togo borders. The four-hour drive started on paved streets and ended up on dirt paths and semi-paved highways where obstacles can slow a car down to five miles an hour. So this is my uh, living quarters in Garu, and if you'll notice, uh, it comes with a mosquito net the Ghanaian government has come up with a very effective program against malaria. Uh, here in Garu, I'm in the hotbed of malaria. It's a malaria hot area according to the World Health Organization. Most of the stings, most of the bites come at night. So uh, this uh, protection right here, this mosquito net, has saved thousands, if not millions of cases of malaria. Yet here, the most remote area that the IRF has been to, Ghana's disabled are well organized, well served, and actually thriving. Soon upon arriving in Garu, I attended a meeting of their local disability council. Ale Moussa, a blind school teacher and a local politician, is the chapter president. Well, do you also have, uh, I know in, uh, in Accra, they get 2% of the, the budget. Do, yes. you all, do you also get some funding? Yes. 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 Two percent. Two percent. It's across the country. It's across the country. It's the whole country. It's the whole country. It's amazing. It's an amazing law. That's a, a lot of money. Who decides who gets to spend or how the two percent is spent? Uh, the committee. We have uh, the chairperson or the chairman of the committee. And uh, currently, this about this week, the chair, the, who, the chairman is the, the director of the social welfare. This is the chairperson of the fund management committee, the disability fund management committee. And then we also have the secretary. And the secretary is the coordinator of the CBR. And uh, we also have some other members. We have two people from, this, uh, from our organization who are representing the, our, our organization in the fund management committee. Although Garou is one of the most remote places I've ever reported from, it's also one of the most accessible, seeing as everything's on the ground floor, every house, every building, every business is accessible. The only health facility in Garu is run by the Northern Presbyterian Health Services. Daniel Atia is a nurse at the facility and describes what happens when serious accidents occur. To uh, a major hospital. Yeah. If they come immediately and we detect that it is a spinal side that is, we make at least the first treatment we give ID line. 
Avilan, yeah. And we called the ambulance, national ambulance or the hospital ambulance to come and convey the, uh, the patient with the nurse. I used to do that. So you go with to, the patient? Yes, yeah, to the patient, to the hospital. And you go to Tamale, is that the nurse? No, sometimes in the Boku that we determine, the doctor will determine that let's go. Okay. To, or even in Accra. In we Accra on the airplane? Yes. So, no, no, yes. You get to Tamale, they'll get the plane there. Okay. But let me talk about Boku. We have this physiotherapist now in Boku. Mm -hmm. You go there to take the x ray and see what is happening. That led to the doctors. And the nurses would be there and see how they are going to transport the patient. John L.O. heads up the regional community-based rehabilitation team that offers medical, financial, and social support to Garu's disabled. Uh, the biggest challenge that I see will be um, how the community, including uh, government organs, will actually receive people with disabilities to be included in whatever is going on within the context of the environment. Because the Disability Act is in place already, Ghana is fortunate to have the Disability Act. But of course, it goes with uh, challenges. Its implementation is not easy because there has to be uh, access to buildings, access to education, access to employment, access to transport, health, and what have you. And uh, sometimes it's not easy to have these things going. Uh, and when it also comes to uh, community level, some of the communities uh, think that uh, disabled people are more like a burden and so they want to shed responsibilities on the project. Isaac Tuga is Garu's local CBR coordinator. He explains his organization's multidisciplinary approach. Multidisciplinary approaches uh, from our perspective has to do with you know, trying to tackle disability from a holistic point of view. And uh, in our presence, we have put in place a team and their sole responsibility is to go to the communities and try to identify various categories of uh, impairments and intervene. In the team, we have a physiotherapist who is looking at physical disability. We have a mental health uh, officer who is assessing mental health conditions. We have uh, an eye nurse who assesses impairments as regards to eye conditions. We also have an audiologist who is also looking at hearing problems. And so um, from a holistic perspective, they go to the community and try to tackle disability from that end. And this plan is in action and succeeding. Over the next few hours, we visited nearly a dozen persons with disability who have not only gotten support for mobility devices like hand cycles and wheelchairs, they were all either working or in school on grants and loans from the Garu CBR. So George, how long does it take you to get to school on your, on your hand bike? 77 minutes. 77 minutes. And then to go home is also 77 minutes. Let me see your arms. Strong, make a muscle. Yeah! Through the program, she's now able to, you know, do her own work. She didn't have anything to do it. But through the community-based rehabilitation, she has been trained. Now she's independent. She's, she's seven apprentices. About seven of them learning under her. She has charged them for a fee. And they are learning and earning income. My name is Tom. Hey. Nice uh, to meet you. Boom, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is your bike? Uh, how far can you how far can you go on this bike? You're able to move from here to Garo Town. Mm -hmm. To our 10 meters. And also to go to the market. Oh, all the products you make here, you can take them on the bike. Wow. Take no them problem. out of a palm of the house. This is the butter. Uh -huh. Give the butter. <laughs> Good. That was the shea butter. <laughs> it's got a different taste, yeah? yeah? But the most inspirational story is that of a mother and her daughter who went from simple farmers to the most successful seamstresses in the region. My name is Tom. Can, uh, this is this is her handbike? Yeah, that's yeah. a handbike. This is the one to move. 
Yes. She goes to the farm to use that one. She goes to the market, that is the one she uses. She's going for a meeting. She's in the group, the DPOs. The DPS. Yeah, she's a, a member of the DPS group. She goes there. Yeah. 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 Hello, ma'am. Yeah. My, my name is Tom. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Fine. This is your shop, yeah? This is where you do your work. My because mother? of her impairment, mm -hmm. if you come with a dress for him to show for you, he will not be able to stand up and take the measurement with a tape measure. He's so not able looks... to take the measurement. But he's able to look at you and make an educated judgment, and he's able to extrapolate and show that he will fit you. Yeah. He's having that skill. I think, I mean, it's a talent that God has given her. Fit you. I think you do. And she's having a lot of customers who are bringing work for her. But while community-based rehabilitation might be a stopgap measure, it is not ideal. Dr. Haig explains why. Community-based rehab is an idea that's been around for at least 30 years, and the idea is for people with disability to be in charge of their own lives. That's a great idea. It's gone in the wrong direction in some ways because the medical aspects of rehabilitation are often ignored by governments and policymakers who think that simply having family members work with the people with disabilities is sufficient. I often compare community-based rehab to community-based neurosurgery. When you look at the expertise of a rehabilitation doctor and what they have to offer, it is a compromise to have the medical care from family members or community health workers. But no report on Ghana would be complete without mentioning football. In Ghana, football is king. I've always wanted to see a big soccer match in Africa, and I was lucky to be in town for an all-star game featuring some of Africa's best taking a break from their European teams. I'm at the Accra Sports Stadium right now. We're watching the World 11 play the Africa 11 in an all-star match. Place about 80% full right now. We have great Ghanaian supporters with us. And we also have disabled people here. You were able to enter the game for free, although it did take me about an hour Some people actually came in their hand cycles and climbed into the seats. So you actually came to the match in your hand bike? Yeah. How long did it take you to get here? About 40 minutes. How was it like riding through traffic in a hand cycle in Accra? Very handy. You can see my father. <laughs> Not only were members of the GSPD enjoying the match, they were also working as stadium vendors. If the future of disability awareness and rehab medicine in Ghana has anything to do with their work ethic, it is certainly a bright future. John Allo has been working in community-based rehab for nearly 30 years and has yet to take a vacation. And just listen to Gifty Gimignanti's work day. I wake up at 4 a.m. And uh, sometimes earlier than that, depends on my schedule for the day. And after waking up, I do what we, I call my quiet time. I pray at about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Then I get up, care for the children, try to get them ready for, uh, get breakfast, snack, lunch ready. Make sure that everyone has got a packed breakfast, uh, packed breakfast lunch supper and everything ready for the day. Then I send the children to school before going to work. But if a day that I have to give a lecture, then it means I have to wake up at three, prepare the lecture for one hour before starting all this routine. Then after teaching, I have to send the children to school, go and teach, come back and pick them up from school, come and make sure that they are done their homework, everything, go back to church. <laughs> then I'll come back around, most of them be closed from church around nine. So when I come back at nine, I come and prepare for the next day. So the things that I can keep over the night, I'll do that and go and sleep around 11. So even if you travel from Accra to Tamale to Garu, you cannot find one single rehabilitation doctor but Ghana does have one of the most comprehensive disability organizations in the world. And this is a sign of hope to the medical professionals. Ghana is in the position to develop in rehabilitation. Uh, we have the resources, we have the people, 
we have the, uh, and I'm saying that what we don't have is just small, money, a little push for Ghana, a little push, I think we can get a modern rehabilitation uh, facility here. It's a pretty exciting thing when you think about Ghana 10 years from now and rehabilitation. We have enough people interested, we have government people interested as well. I think at that point you're going to have some centers all over the country that take care of people with disability. You're going to have prosthetics and orthotics. You're going to have a rehab residency, the first one in West Africa that's going to train the next generation. And it's going to be a self-sustained thing. It's not going to be charity from the West, it's going to be Ghana taking care of itself.